welcome again. Welcome to the Maschine Hallen. Welcome to something particular, something quite extraordinary taking place over the next seven, eight, eight nine hours. But only the first hour will be taking place in this room, and the, the rest is, uh, is outside. You will perhaps have noticed these cards lying on the desks, uh, slot, sorry, the chairs. We'll get back to those cards very soon. Let's get it started. Right. Time is a scarce resource. Too little time is to do a lot of things. Too, much, too many things, some would say. And yet, what we too, truly try set out to do is to show and dem demonstrate that time is enough. You can actually tell a story, a passionate story, with 20 slides changing automatically every 15 seconds in five minutes. And no, I actually didn't forget what I was to say, but these 15 seconds tumbling down the elevator pitch was just to, to show you about the evening's theme, the life on a bench. No, that's not completely true. But 15 seconds is, is enough of time. The theme of tonight is not living on a bench. It's not anything close to living on a bench, but it's rather learning on a bench. Like Forrest Gump, meeting a lot of different strange people, foreign foreign people, other people, and he engages into conversations with each of, uh, and one of them. The point being, every single contact that we make around in this room, in other rooms, in every kind of situation where we meet other people is crucial to the concert making. The format that we use tonight is all about showing and telling about the tip of the iceberg. Nothing much, there's a lot of uh, things and data and di details and all this stuff behind the surface, below the surface, but it's not enough to say the essence, to give away the essence. From this very mountain, Moses received the, the ten commitments, commitments? I, I, thank you, I always forget the word. From this very mountain, I, I've never been there, and ever since... In many other mountain areas, in many other places, people have searched the big question, why? And actually, the, the why is a pretty good driving force, is a pretty good question to keep looking ahead. In a daily life, this is actually a very good illustration of the Kia Eco Week, some would say. <coughs> Others would say it's something completely different. <laughs> Anyways, in, in, a, in a daily life that is quite hectic and chaotic and turbulent, we are all just wheels turning around in a big machinery. You are. Not rusty wheels, as this one, of course. But we are all just wheels making contact points, making things do. This gentleman, an old friend of ours, Pablo Picasso, once said that great artists are inspired, geniuses steal. And we like that saying. You should go out and make, make sure to be inspired from everywhere, around the cubicles, in your daily working environment. You should be inspired and you should steal whatever you can use. Because in stealing, you will take ownership of the things that you can actually make a, a difference with. A friend of ours took this picture. Somewhere in Japan, a man raised, raised, a, raised a Statue of Liberty in his private garden. All, stand, all that standed behind after the tsunami was the Statue of Liberty. That is something to, to aim for. Also, it's, it's, it's an illustration, in our opinion, of the fact that the strategic plan behind it all, well, doing things. You should do things. We, you are doing things in these many workshops. Another friend of ours, it's not this guy, but he said, you get far with a smile. You get it further with a smile and a gun. And that thing, he was true, but never forget the smile, never forget the fact that that's, we, we get further if we help and assist each other, even though we sometimes make use of a gun. So, now we turn to the topic of tonight, city development. I don't know if this is the right picture or this one. You are the experts, and the next following speakers from this stage will be the experts and take us through a lot of different 
scopes and perspectives and angles on sustainable development, I think. I hope that you will be ready, are ready to hang around for the next little hour or so. Take a deep breath. We are all among friends here. We are all interested in sharing some glimpses of ideas. This was five minutes. Thank you. I'm not going to pace. I'm going to just blow your mind with a lot of slides. There is a story here and there is a story here. You get like 10 lectures, a course on Tel Aviv in five minutes. The major idea I'd like to ignite here is how time and our cultural models and perceptions about time play a significant role in sustainability. Time is money. Time gets shorter in our global cultures. We live in an augmented reality, trying to catch as much as we can, absorbing stimuli, knowledge, and experiences that supposedly give us the chance to live a few lives simultaneously. But I think that sustainability is about accommodating to our homo sapiens brains and nature. And thus, this five minutes presentation, I think, is not sustainable. Okay? <laughs> Okay, so that's how Tel Aviv started with people. People were in the center. They came from Europe holding foreign agendas to the place. This was the site. This is Jaffa right here. This is where Tel Aviv started as a suburb to Jaffa, the Hebrew modern suburb that uh, had to be um, representing the rising of the new Hebrews. So what are the new Hebrews? How do they build? You know, the Hebrew language was revived after 2,000 years. People were really excited about it, and thus they put the cathedral, which you saw before, which is the Hebrew gymnasium uh, at their main street. Uh, among their modern ideas was the idea of living comfortably, and so they tried to design a garden suburb uh, where they'll get better lifestyles than in old Jaffa. Uh, they were in search for the language of the new Hebrews, uh, very much like the 19th century type of searches, which led to all sorts of eclectic representations. In the first 20, 15 years, Tel Aviv developed as a patchwork of different neighborhoods, and only then there was a time to start really planning it. Um, until then, it was just one neighborhood after the other. We were lucky enough to have the British mandate uh, at that time, uh, who brought in Sir Patrick Geddes from Scotland, who is an ecologist and a biologist. And this guy planned one of the best sections that is a sustainable section uh, in Tel Aviv. I happened to live there. He gave it a good hierarchy. He gave it a lot of thought about the quality of life within the city, mixed uses, all the nice things that we are reviving now were there. Uh, his plan came up together blended with the white city architecture, um, the new international, the international style that was adopted, and from then on, modernist agendas represented um, the Tel Aviv identity. Uh, so you see here a city in the sand, modern suburb, the Hebrew city, garden city, white city, and then in 93, Tel Aviv became uh, the non-stop city, a very vibrant city that had a lot of previous uh, identities behind it. And many places that were uh, um, collective, uh, had collective meanings were destroyed, and now we have this. Uh, in the last 20 years, it feels like we are under the late capitalism attack. Uh, we have a lot of uh, movements going on at the same time, sustainable ideas. Uh, and the major, the major conflicts that uh, we have today are between us being a city-state, the Israeli metropolis, to its citizen city, uh, a global city versus its citizen city. And under this line, uh, two years ago, we had big demonstration, like they were all over Europe, of people reclaiming the public realm. 
Okay, now it was a national thing, but it happened mostly in Tel Aviv. People want to get their cities back from the hands of money and the hands of those who plan top down and to have an effect of how their uh, environment uh, looks like. Um, so with better tax sustainability uh, serious, uh, we can pick it back from the Geddes plan and other ide good ideas that were before so that we live a better city for the future generations. Thank you. Good evening. Well, I thought I would be so smart and attack the confines of this presentation by doing two things. First of all, talk like Donald Duck in that speed. Second of all, since I was taught that it's bad pedagogy to show more than one slide per minute because it'll uh, be too much to digest for eyes and minds, I thought it was so clever, so you will find I repeated some slides. I think it will still be irritating and bad, but that's how I do it. My short presentation is called Form Follows Performance. You all know the mantra, Form Follows uh, function, you would think, it also has, also has been coined form follows finance and other interesting twists, but we think form follows performance, and by that do I mean the time is right for our profession to stop being incompetent and also to stop being liars, frankly. Um, the, what I'm trying to get to is the fact that I wrote a book that is out just now called The World's Greenest Buildings, which I think is quite the humorous title. Uh, it was written together with an American author of the name Jerry Udelson. And <clears throat> recently it came out, I showed it to my mother, being very proud, I said, look, mama, this is, this is my latest book. It's called The World's Greenest Building. She took a look and said, these buildings are not green. <laughs> and she has a point. Uh, the point is, gray is the new green. And Jerry and I, we're not alone probably to think that we're very, it's time to be tired of greenwashing. We should no longer believe our colleagues. Everybody claims, you know, that this is green and this is eco and this is sustain sustainable and this is environmentally friendly. Of course, hardly anything ever is. And even lead gold or platinum buildings often are very poor performers. So the big surprise is even in the most advanced, most widely used green rating systems, performance, energy performance is hardly ever measured. We think nature may be a good role model. In Germany, there was a debate in the 19th century amongst art historians, should design follow nature's role or art's role? And they think there may be a third path, which could be performance's uh, path. Um, nature has it so that a fish or a jellyfish doesn't want to be square because its shapes, its beautiful, elegant shapes, actually great role models, are a product of evolution, of course, and as such, a product of performance. And um, what we did was, what we set out to do was something seemingly very simple, and that is to gather the data, which is to say post-occupancy evaluation data from the world's greenest buildings. And it turned out to be an almost impossible task, because all too seldomly are there data available, and even if once in a while there are data available, often people will not be happy or willing to communicate them, because they think they're bad, and often they are bad. So uh, we hope to start a new trend in our profession that people, first of all, do measure the energy consumption of our buildings. I mean, that seems banal, but actually is hardly ever done. And second of all, uh, create some more transparency so that we can learn from one another. And um, well, my job was to collect case studies from Europe uh, where I live and also from East Asia where I travel uh, quite often. And uh, probably the time only allows to show you one quick uh, uh, sample. It will be a corporate building um, because uh, I thought that was an interesting typology. It is a headquarter of a steel company in the city of Essen in the western industrial part of uh, Germany. It was designed by some French architects of the name Schwach Emrel. And it does several things right, I think. For example, natural lighting, natural ventilation. Bah, I mean, that sounds banal, but is also hardly ever done. You'll find the building actually has nice cutouts, it's nicely thin, there's a trend towards thin buildings because only with thin buildings can you have cross ventilation and natural daylighting uh, really happening. It's, it has something very key that is of course invisible, which is a major geothermal plant 
and uh, the main thing that I very quickly want to comment on is the facades, or the two facades rather. You'll find the big cat out has a very beautifully designed um, structural glazing facade, but more interestingly, the office wings have this rather intriguing, I want to call it an origami style uh, facade uh, made of stainless steel. Since the user and client for this building is a steel company, it made a lot of sense to use stainless steel for these beautifully folding uh, sunscreens because, well, uh, there's a trend in Europe to get rid of air conditioning altogether. We want to drive our engineer friends into unemployment that way. And one way to do that is to have, um, well, sunscreening outside, of course. And in a tall corporate building, the wind is going to play with it, so it has to be rather rigid. And here's a beautiful uh, scenario. You know, the employees themselves can determine do they want them open or closed, depending on whether or not they're working on paper or on the computer screen. And you will find it is so tricky. The kinetic facade uh, can look different at different hours of the day. You know, you may think, well, if we want our buildings to be cool in summer and warm in winter, how do we as humans do it? And we do it through clothing, of course. But traditionally, buildings cannot alter their clothing. They will wear the same clothes in summer and in winter and in morning and in evening. So finally, <laughs> oh my god, I'm going out of breath here. Uh, you can even set it to a setting where the, where the facade uh, screens will actually follow the path of the sun during the course of a day. And that's it. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> the need for action now, really uh, inspired here. Woke up one morning and found out that there's a cloudburst plan. So we're just waiting for this next disaster. And the engineer we met on the first day said how important this is. Because at the moment, all we're doing is incremental change. And we need quantum change. We can't continue to do paint by number, slightly better architecture. We need to go back to the roots look at those radishes and pull them out and restart, shake up the entire game. This solution works for 5% of the world, those who can afford solar panels on homes that actually house cars, cars next to their major homes. And we can't use this as we go around the world looking at the other 95%. So we got to step backwards to leap forward. We have to facilitate our discussions. We have to collaborate. We have to learn how to communicate give space to the stakeholders, the multiple stakeholders, get our engineers to actually be creative and poetic. An architect who's been doing this, he's looked at cloudburst, Balkrishna Doshi in India, he celebrated the monsoon. For him, he came up with the drawing of how can the water and the power of the monsoon actually instigate an architecture that mixes landscape and building, where the form is local, it's part of the bioclimatic thinking, it's part of the design of the building that the air and the movement and the, and the mass and the curve and the form all come together. This form of architecture where landscape and urban design come together is somewhat rare, but it's starting to be seen in schools across North America. My colleague Brooke Muller teaching at the University of Oregon with his students exploring how form, nature, biomimicry can actually pull together and this whole inter-digital component. And with my graduate student looking at how we're gonna mine the actual context really understand data in a holistic fashion. Look for the synergies between programming, between existing historical and cultural conditions. And so our work on Benny Farm, a housing project built in 1947 after the Second World War, which was all about encompassing Garden City, Ebenezer Howard's dream of this mixture between urban and rural. And really, it was a wonderful experiment. And then the government in the mid-90s said, we can't afford to keep this going. Let's demolish the entire site. And so you see on the right, holding on somehow to the morphology by doubling the height, tripling the density, and somehow selling the farm. And this selling of the farm was unacceptable. And we learned from the best activists in our neighborhood that red equals green. The artist Martha Rossler, housing has to be rethought as a social resource, not simply as a series of opportunities for profit. And so we learned how to work with the community. We learned what it is to do a community land trust where you have residents with equal power over the local consultants, equal power over the general experts, and together the three look at how to save money for everyone and, and take over and empower their own development. And through this integrated design process, we came up with a different vision, where landscape and district energy were actually going to become the tools and empower the people to control their own future, where the single mothers who were going back to school because of their 
young kids were somehow connected with an entire new building fabric. <laughs> Recycling the buildings, looking at the skin, looking at the lungs, looking at the kidneys, the different components of the buildings, and doing so within social housing budgets. And this became an experiment. And as Ulf says, not all experiments totally work. We did look at getting down to almost net zero carbon over time. And we did rely on some renewable technologies. But in social housing, this isn't the most obvious way. You need to have a larger scale. You need more robustness. And so our next project was actually trying to dynamically look at an entire community. A dormant industrial context in Montreal, low density suburb, right on a rail line, a Todd possibility. A golf course sitting there doing basically nothing. Trying to listen to the land and the people. So the vision really was, instead of spreading the entire site with the usual suburban sprawl, giving back 10% to the community, and really in a certain sense selling off the entire 90%, what if a developer did a different vision? What if they actually looked at water actually being part of the revival, part of the metabolic processes? What if we actually uh, we looked at community shared space design, where a child could walk out the front door, go to a park, and not have to cross a major street? And so this kind of new social contract was saying, let's only privatize 30%, 50% back to the park and green spaces, another 20% shared space design. But can a city actually handle this? This is a tough challenge. They actually have to figure out how can developers ethically partner with cities? How can we do so in the states of corruption that we have in Montreal? Right now, this is the future, the people and the power. Thank you very much. And as you see here, this is about the outstanding, the ordinary, and the public space. Uh, Ever since the, the Renaissance, architects have aimed to do the outstanding design. That's, uh, their whole mindset is about that. And it's a blessing to society when the result is like here, for example, and it goes hand in hand with the outstanding functions, also like in Sydney, something new. We like that, it's good for society. But that's an outstanding function, and a shaping that follows the outstanding function as well. The problem is when you have an ordinary function and the attempt is to make that look outstanding. That's a conflict and a problem to all society. And we have it and continue to do like this. In Sweden, in Jakreborg, they have something old fashioned and you can see how it's a picture of a democratic society. Buildings stand up shoulder by shoulder and make the wall to the public space. But this is somehow faking, because it tried to look like this, and it's brand new. This is the original old fabric in Detmold in Germany. And there were never buildings exactly like that in that part of Sweden. But uh, in Copenhagen, back in time, it was there. You can see the gable buildings. You can see the ordinary fabric and the outstanding structures. And both goes well hand in hand, and it's a nice picture. Um, here you see some of it left in Copenhagen, but most buildings now are tenement buildings, but this is a small tenement building. That's due to the fires, so we have only very little left of the old structures in Copenhagen. Um, and here you see such, such newer buildings. They are tenement buildings, but still the block is parted in different properties and behind the outstanding building. Um, this is the first time in Copenhagen when somebody attempted to uh, put a uniform uh, around people. So this was for naval, naval staff, and the king did this, so the whole family was put in here. Uh, in Sweden, they have this tall landmark in Malmö, um, and it works well as a landmark, but there's a problem. What is in it is rather ordinary. There's a conflict there. This is what meets my eye when I wake up uh, in the morning uh, at this time. And I'm pleased and I'm in a good mood when I leave my home. And I continue to be in a good mood, a, a part of the road there, here, for example. Well, both my garden and this is um, uh, characterized by it not being planned. It was there all the time. No now there's put tarmac on it, but it's still the old uh, tr uh, trench 
uh, through the landscape. But then I come to something planned, and that is ugly. That is not pleasing me anymore. I want to pass as quick as possible through this area here. And it continues like that uh, when I get further on into Copenhagen, like here, for example. This is also planned. It's take, uh, taken a lot of hours to decide that it should be exactly like that. But it's not pleasing me. I don't know who is ple it's pleasing. But then, continuing a bit, I can come to something not planned, self-grown. And that's nice, the old uh, fabric there. So uh, what should I, what should we do? How should we plan? Here I was standing with a group of architects and looking at this structure called the whale. They would, were all uh, somehow admiring details and thought that it would be nice to have such an assignment but they would not live in it themselves. When we went to this area, they saw something they would like to live in. Uh, this is uh, expressing the individual unit, and it's in a new fabric. It's a new design. But we continue to do this. Maybe it looks nice from a distance, and in sunshine, and when it's not blowing. But it's not nice to be up to it, and uh, whose balcony is that? Uh, people reaching the peak of uh, the uh, uh, Maslow's pyramid here of the human needs, they desire something else. And we want all people to be there, don't we? We deserve better. We all do. When will we get it? Thank you. Thank you. Well, some days ago, before coming, I met this new at USP Journal newspaper talking about a sustainable house they have made which could use and produce its own energy completely. And I found it very interesting, not because of the new itself, but because of the name they gave, Echo House, which is an Indian name and means, Brazilian Indian name, which means way of living, way of life. I found it was very interesting to make this connection between eco and this eco, talking about, thinking about ecological sustainability, ability, something related to sustain, and also this eco way of living of the Indians um, point. I had made a, a big research about meanings, and I also found this word with a different meaning, that in Brazil, in Portuguese, it means something related to sound, the echo, the echo of the sound. The echo of the sound sometimes comes from things that you repeat to one another, stories that pass, um, habits, traditions, things that are shared in a very common way. Also, thinking about this encounter of people or encounter of um, same reasons or same interests, like a source of energy. It's a convergent point and it's also a point that so it's source of many other uh, contaminations of the structures. Nature is very wise and nature tells us many, many different systems, many continuity, many different and uniform things made by strange points. It, we, they look like equal, but they are completely different. And man copies like it, using this as an inspiration. Man also tries to explore these connections that we can find between different systems, different people, different ways of living, different ways of seeing the things. I would like to invite you to think about this. We may have different features, we may have different costumes, we may have different ways of living, but we have many things in common. And maybe one of these common things should be thinking about how to establish some connections and get our own purpose. Here we have a meeting point. At Echo Week, we have people from very different places coming together to discuss how to preserve the planet, how to preserve the resource. The BioThink um, mentality teaches us something very interesting, how to get complexity and using the complexity of these differences, use, uh, getting to one good result. And then I get again to the echo, sound, 
uh, point of view, which means that each single point has and makes interferences. We interfere in the other's way of living. We also have our own way of in, uh, receiving interfering from the others. And this makes a very nice connection when you try to find this meeting points, these points where we can meet our coincidences, we can meet our uh, possibility of getting some energy. It's very funny how we can find very nice structures, live structures, very poetical ones, taking profit from our differences, taking profit from, our, from the connections we make between the points that we represent. There is another phenomenon talking about interference, which is amplitude. You know that if the interference can be um, very, I mean, it can, can have power, we maybe have some very nice points which sometimes don't seem to be very in harmony or very predictable, but they mean a lot. They mean that the main point of all discussion, all these connections that we might found is the human being. We have to look for human being because human being is the goal that we, are, that we have in common. The best and the most interesting experience is to plan, to design, to think about how to make these connections a very good power for us to reach our common interest, which is making human life better, making human life something available. And I guess that if we reach this point, we get this single phenomena, which is a very strong power, full point, and also the turning point, the way that we all use it as a common sense. That's it. Thank you. So uh, let me talk about my PhD presentation here in the Ecobeek Sustainable Social Housing, the user focus. Um, everyday life uh, and uh, consumption, as we can see here, are closely uh, related. Uh, so sustainability technology uh, and uh, everyday life is uh, connected. Um, experience of uh, maintains and change in the practice um, moves the th theories about uh, technology and uh, consumption. And uh, the uh, residents uh, uh, change and, uh, in, in practice and behavior um, will uh, also uh, be different and it will, uh, there are some holes in uh, advisors for the users. This uh, PhD project uh, will uh, illustrate uh, the relation between uh, uh, architecture, sustainability, and the users. Uh, it's a multiple uh, case uh, study, uh, and by interviewing uh, different user groups uh, concerning about decision making, living, and using sustainable uh, social housing in Denmark. Uh, it's a study of uh, everyday practice uh, and valuating of uh, the facility management department, the caretaker, and the residents, uh, and the cat, I can see it there. And uh, so we can ask how sustainable uh, are uh, the, uh, these houses if expected uh, learning and behavior are uh, as the intentions of the architects are uh, not happen. So uh, in, uh, this, uh, uh, residents' democracy uh, are covered by Danish law uh, of social housing, uh, and uh, the users can actually reject or uh, accept uh, ideas of sustainability for their settlements. And the end users uh, do need to have information, skills, and learning uh, about the sustainable solutions, and the caretaker uh, has, of course, necessary, uh, they should uh, have a dialogue. So uh, you can see these users here, how to, can we ensure a better interaction between different uh, user groups in uh, this social housing? Uh, how can we collect uh, users' uh, uh, experiences uh, and uh, learn uh, from the idea of the architect to the sketch to the building 
uh, to the operational phase to the user and back to the architect. It will be done uh, by uh, interviewing uh, and it's uh, a uh, research uh, uh, interview by qualitative to have the narrative stories uh, and um, of everyday life. So how is the knowledge uh, when we uh, turn it uh, from the project to the uh, sustainable social housing company? Uh, can and will they grab this information? Uh, are there informations? Uh, uh, have, do they have the competence? Uh, and, uh, and will? Uh, will? Uh, it's about value. And uh, how do the users value uh, the architect, uh, uh, the uh, everyday life, the architecture, uh, the decision making, and also the sustainability? Uh, how is the communication about servicing, servicing uh, the buildings? Do every uh, of these user groups understand how to act uh, uh, in court to uh, this uh, uh, sustainable solution. That will be raised questions uh, about uh, the experiences from the past, but of course also for the future in the forthcoming planning of new buildings, uh, sustainable buildings. So there will be specific uh, experiences about each of these cases uh, in Denmark. And of course, there can be drawn more general uh, experiences uh, through across every of these uh, cases. So the users are just as important as the technology. technology. My name is Jan Johansson. It's a PhD project uh, with, uh, in col collaboration with uh, KEA and the School of Architecture in Copenhagen. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I'll talk about something which may not look uh, sustainable for, at first glance. At least these buildings are not performing as sustainable or regarded as sustainable in a, in a regular sense as we talk about it today. They have a sort of like cultural sustainability and that's what I'm going to try to talk about. There are three examples across time. The first one is Vestasuhus by Kai Fisker that was built in the late 30s. And it was a large construction, one of the largest masonry construction at the time in Copenhagen, in the city of Copenhagen, sitting right on the edge of St. Jørgen Lake in the center of Copenhagen. As you see, it is a long building that faces the lake. And uh, Kai Fisker was very fascinated by functionalism at the time and wanted to serve people by providing nice apartments that had large windows towards the lake and was, was benefiting from the sun. Whereas the backside, as you see, was much darker and, and more enclosed. However, there was also thought about the recreational use of the space, such as the squash hall sitting here in the back. Um, the building was, was um, oh, the, the client was by a, was a private contractor, and he was also the, um, the, the mason who, who actually did the construction. A spe very special feature is this bay window balcony sort of detail, which was which was dealt with in, in high, in, as, as high class sort of design solution. And as you see, there was a very great attention to, to the, 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 um, the fabric of the, of, the, of the masonry and also how, the, how, the, how the actually the, the very various parts were painted and, and the color feature. It has this sort of uh, geometric uh, sense to the detailing of the bonding that actually reflects into the larger scale of the building. So in that sense, it was sort of a holistic design concept that was used for the building at the time. And it was sort of very, very cutting edge also in terms of not only the facade solution, but also the, um, the actual plans. Um, this next building is actually standing on the shoulders of Mr. Suhus. And it was designed by Lungo Tranberg Architects, who also did the... Uh, the, the um, uh, Schauspielhaus, what's it called in English, um, and, and the SEB bank uh, on the harbor front. This was also by a private client and a large uh, building complex that was meant for um, um, citizens who didn't have a, a proper uh, citizenship or state uh, permanently in Denmark. So these were large apartments that were supposed to be attractive to, to these various new um, uh, inhabitants. So for that reason, they also had uh, a good budget where they could use good materials, nice bricks, first of all, 
And as you see, there was also this, this um, attention towards the, the, the details, but also at, the, at this time, a, a, a present or up-to-date sort of um, reinterpretation of the detailing, how the, how the window glass was put into the facade. And yet, we also see how the very fabric or the bonding of the brick or the masonry sort of texture also reflects sort of this, this grayish hue that comes or is part of the, of the whole, the overall sense of the detail. The last example is by Van Kunsten, um, a contemporary uh, design office here in, in Copenhagen. And they also did this design for a private client. However, the budget was, was a low budget. And as that, that may also reflect uh, the, the very building. Also, you see the, the whole, the main features in terms of, of the section and the plans, they are all, they're all more or less the same. They didn't, they didn't really have much uh, difference in terms of, 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 the different, of the two facades turning um, towards the courtyard and towards the, the, the garden. However, it's, it's an industrialized concept. And what they try to do here is actually mimic or interpret, reinterpret sort of the masonry structure and, and sort of blend it into these, these uh, concrete structures. What is interesting is that it, also only cons it only consists of about four different elements that are put vice versa and upside down in order to make this sort of variety in the facades. And yet you have an, you have an idea that it's, it's much more varied than it actually is. However, the, as we see here, the, again, the, uh, the, the balconies are trying to be be put onto the facade. However, the very structure doesn't really allow for the, for the spatial sort of uh, depth in, in the facade. What I'm trying to talk about here is the fact that how, how do details carry um, or can become signifiers of cultural identity and an understanding of materials and the, the very uh, cultural setting. And in that sense, I, I'll try to, to define cultural sustainability as a matter of durability, usability, and beauty, which is sort of like the, the very essence of architecture. And we see how these various <coughs> examples is actually trying to do that. Thank you. Are you ready? Please, yeah. Extra, extra, read all about it. Uh, BIM is achieving maturity, and uh, we're beginning to see how it can help sustainability and a lot of other things. And it's moving us forward in a way that we couldn't do before. Um, we have and have had, sorry, what I call an air sandwich, where you have this disconnect between strategy and implementation. And it has given problems to us in many, many ways. If we look at the way we procure a building, we have these knowledge drops where we hand over at each stage of the design. And each time there's a handover, we lose a lot of the intent. If we put it into BIM, we keep it there. In keeping it there, we provide an umbrella which can be an organizational or method of keeping it all in one, under the one roof. Or as another person said, we can put it in a container. And so what you get is a one-stop shop. Clients want a one-stop shop. If we look at the McLeamy curves, we have this famous uh, ability to make changes against the cost of making changes. And we have the traditional uh, bell curve of how buildings were made. BIM allows us to bring that earlier in the process. But if you're only getting paid for each stage for this piece, and this piece, and this piece, you're working at risk if you're BIMing. So we need to look at restructuring how you pay for things. And this brings us on to the BIM maturity plan, which is currently about here, which is today and by 2016 wants to be moving on into a more bimmed world. Uh, there's many ways of doing this, and it requires standards, it requires guides. I know all the things you don't want to hear about, but it's happening, and it's happening for a purpose. And it means that people are taking it seriously, uh, contractors are looking for it, uh, clients are asking for it. We need to get on it, because if we do it, we get better informed design. We get, we're able to make, to check, to coordinate, to, to look at our, uh, to communicate better. We get certainty. We get the ability to simulate, to analyze. If we look 300 years ago, this building was built with maybe 10 drawings. 
This building today, it took an army of people. It's bigger, it's harder. Materials have changed. In 20 years, we've gone from 50,000 to 150,000 building materials. We used to be able to get by with solid constructions, massive constructions, doing all of these things. We're moving continually into sandwich constructions where each element is doing a different job. This needs management, it needs control. We've got to find ways of doing it. Finding solutions. If we can't measure it, my contention is that we can't deal with it. So we need to start simulating, looking at what the energy is we're using. We can do this by doing BIM. We can do this by putting data in so that we can extract data out. If you look at this, greenhouse gas emissions, electricity and heating counts for a quarter of the gases we're emitting. Airplanes are not even 2%, and we're complaining about people flying to Sydney. If we could sort out our houses, we could save the planet. What the gases are doing are making this ozone layer go away. It's changing the climate. We're getting warmer. Where we're getting warmer, we're getting changes in our climate. This is a um, deviation, standard deviation. And what it means is over here, we're getting more changes in the weather. We're getting the flash floods. We're getting sitting outside at Christmas, but having snow at Easter. And to do all of this, we're measuring again. We need to look at the carbon we've got. Currently, carbon is sold on the market for around $8 a ton. It needs to go to $25 so that it makes feasible things like uh, solar panels. They're not feasible today because the payback is not there. So these are the changes. LED lighting we're doing, it's a no-brainer. But we want to get over to these other things. If we come back to our air sandwich at the beginning, if we begin to do these things, we start putting meat in the sandwich. And that means we're getting better, more certain ways of working. And that's all, folks. <laughs>